Baruch Shem, this is Mark Lichtenwalter. This is Fundamentally Mormon coming to you live on this 10th day of January 2020. Uh, the guest call in number is 917 889 8827. That's 917 889 8827. Today we are going to be covering Chapter 12 of the Church and the Priesthood The Excommunication of Jesus Christ and His Believers. And uh, I'm also live streaming. Hopefully it won't be so choppy this time at youtube.com forward slash user forward slash God is my compass. Um, <clears throat> but the, uh, the blog talk radio.com forward slash fundamentally Mormon. And once it is uploaded to iTunes on my podcast, fundamentally Mormon, the audio quality never skips. So we shouldn't have a problem there. Just uh, always seems to have a problem with the live streaming since uh, right now it even says your connection is unstable. Please wait while we try reconnecting. So <laughs> it is what it is. Anyway, so um, let's just get right into the reading. It is a longer chapter on the audio reader that I uh, used to listen to the program uh, or to the reading before I actually read it to everyone on the uh, radio program. The, uh, the time of the reading is 35 minutes, which probably will take me about two, two and a half hours. Uh, it just depends on how long, uh, well, my commentary and stuff. So, Anyway, I do want to thank you all for listening. Uh, let's get right into the reading. The Excommunication of Jesus and His Believers, Chapter 12 of The Church and the Priesthood by Ogden Kraut. When Jacob gathered his twelve sons together to give them their patriarchal blessing, blessings, he prophesied what would happen to their descendants down to the last days. In the blessing for Judah and his tribe, he declared, the scepter, of, or the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from be, between his feet until uh, Shiloh comes, the Savior. Uh, Genesis chapter 49, verse 10. See, that's an interpretation I don't agree with, because the scepter of power did not depart from Jesus, who was of the tribe of Judah, and it didn't depart from Peter, James, and John until it was passed from uh, somebody of the tribe of Judah to an Ephraimite named Joseph Smith, who was a prophet that opened up this last dispensation. I believe that Shiloh is Jesus Christ, not Yeshua or Jesus, because Jesus was of the tribe of Judah, and the, the scepter of power should not depart from Judah or from the tribe of Judah until Shiloh comes, and it didn't depart from the tribe of Judah when Jesus had it because he was of the tribe of Judah. It didn't depart from Peter uh, until he gave it to Joseph Smith, and then that scepter, that, that power was given to the tribe of Ephraim for the restoration, for the uh for the restoring and the gathering of the ten lost tribes of Israel in these last days. So, anyway, but uh, Ogden Kraut and many others believe that Jesus is Shiloh. I just don't. So, use a little bit of uh, critical thinking and logical whatever to come to my conclusion. It's not by revelation at all that I come to that conclusion, but I don't believe it's by revelation that Ogden came to that conclusion, and I don't believe it's by um, revelation that anybody comes to the conclusion that Jesus is Shiloh because I, they, there's no revelation that says it as far as I'm concerned or as far as I'm aware. Anyway, continuing on, to Moses was given the task of giving the priesthood or the scepter and its higher laws, but the people did not qualify. So Moses established a church with the Aaronic priesthood and its lesser laws. The Jews, or the descendants of Judah, maintain both priesthood, its principles, ordinances, and the church down to the time that the Savior, or who he says Shiloh, came to the earth. Once again, Joseph Smith is Shiloh, not Jesus Christ. See, everybody in Christendom, they all think that all these prophecies are all about Jesus except for a couple, like Revelations chapter 11 talks about the two witnesses. 
they know that that's not Jesus. There are two witnesses that come in the last days. And then there's one in Romans that talks about um, to the gathering of Israel in the last days. And it talks about a lawgiver. And uh, I don't believe very many people believe that as Jesus. I don't think they actually know who it is. Uh, I think it's just speculation pretty much. Anyway, continuing on. Jesus was born and raised in this church and soon became a full-fledged rabbi with all their rights and privileges of teaching the gospel. Jesus, however, was blessed with such wisdom and understanding that even at age 12, he, he confounded the wisest of the Pharisees on priesthood issues. See, we know that Jesus was a rabbi, uh, for many, there's a, a lot of different evidences that he was a rabbi, uh, not just that he went around teaching, because anybody could have done that. But um, you had to wait till you were 30 in order to. Um, it's been a while since I've studied this topic, but you had to wait till you were 30 in order to um, to be ordained or set apart as a rabbi, and that's when his ministry started. He also had to be married at that age, and I believe that the marriage at Canaan or Cana was that um, was his wedding. So, just adjusting this real, real quick right here uh, for those of you watching the the video. So, all right, let's see here. When he began to teach the laws of the higher priesthood, he was rejected and cast out of the synagogues. This story of Christ's rejection is told in the King James Version of the Bible, but it is told better in some of the other versions. For example, note Daniel's prophecy of, of this from three different Bible versions. So we're on page 197 of the church and the priesthood now on the blog talk radio and in the itunes you're going to see a link to ogden kraut's book the church and the priesthood so that you can find it easily at that point um i'm still dealing with google and trying to get my domain name fundamentally mormon.com up and running i have submitted some emails uh to to try to resolve the issue whatever the issue is it says on the website it says i canceled the the website i didn't cancel it somebody canceled it for me probably some overzealous mormon that doesn't like my program or what i teach who knows but um Hopefully, we can get that issue resolved here in the next week or two, hopefully. Or if not, this will be the third website I've lost by interference from people that don't want my information to be put out there. But luckily, we have OgdenKraut.com, and you can go there and read along. Uh, you don't have to read my commentary uh, or listen to my commentary. You can just read it for yourself. Also, on Facebook, I will be posting the the full reading of whatever we get through today. I tried to do a chapter a day. Might have to do two parts. I don't know. But we're on 197 for anyone who wants to uh, read along with this audio or this video program. So, And after three score in two weeks, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. King James Bible, Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 also, after 62 sevens, the anointed one, which is what Messiah means, will be cut off and will have nothing. New International Bible, Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. In another version of the Bible, it says seven of those 70 will pass till the appearance of, of the anointed one, the Messiah, a prince. Then for 62, it will remain re, uh, restored rebuilt with streets and conduits at the critical time after the 62 have passed the anointing the anointed prince will be removed and no one will take his part oxford by uh, oxford study bible daniel chapter 12 or 9 verse 25 page 926 I don't understand why they think that they can just add a whole bunch of com our words to what is scripture like uh, people that understand the Hebrew language, if it was directly translated straight from Hebrew into English, 
it would read in such a way that you wouldn't even be able to understand it at all. Um, the King James translators, they tried to uh, add words that would help people to understand the gist of the translation. And they were honest enough to actually italicize the words um, that they added. Uh, but other Bible commentaries or Bible translations, they don't do that. So anyway, continuing on. Some Bibles actually translate the original Greek words into the English word excommunication, pertaining to Jesus and his disciples. And that's interesting because the Septuagint did not include the book of Daniel. So you can't have the original Greek words in the Bible. Why don't they just go to the Hebrew Bible? I, I don't understand. The Septuagint which was translated into Greek because there were so many Hellenized Jews, actually just translated, and we know who did it too, but they translated what they called the Pentateuch, or the five, first five books of Moses, which was uh, Genesis, uh, Deuteronomy, Exodus, Leviticus, and I can't remember, sorry. Anyway, but it was the first five books from the Hebrew into the Greek. Somebody else came along at a later date. We don't have evidence of this till after the death of Jesus Christ, where they translated the Old Testament or the Tanakh into Greek. So, but it was all originally in Hebrew. Uh, and, and in the days of Jesus, they still spoke Hebrew in the synagogues. They also spoke Aramaic and Greek. So, <laughs> Let's see here. Most of the people lived in fear of the Pharisees, knowing that they, too, might be cast out or excommunicated from the church. Jesus was already a marked man when he was born in the meridian of time. Many innocent children were murdered in Herod's effort to kill him. Not only was he persecuted, smitten, and tried by the law of, of the Gentiles, he was also rejected of his own. These were times that tried men's souls, and it was also a trial of the fullness of the holy priesthood. As a rabbi, Jesus held a very high position in the community and was a master teacher in all the synagogues. So the Jews only had the Aaronic priesthood. In order for a prophet to receive the fullness of the priesthood at any time, Jesus' time, Moses' time, our time, the father actually, and Joseph Smith taught this, that all of the prophets received their, the fullness of the priesthood under the hand of the father. That's how it's still done today. People can receive the Melchizedek priesthood by a man who has, has the authority to give it, which means they've had it properly conferred upon them. But in order to receive the fullness, you have to have it given to you of the Father. And I believe that Jesus received the fullness after his 40-day and 40-night fast when he was upon the mountain. And I don't think that any commentaries or any translations that we have or that I'm aware of actually talk about this, but I believe that Jesus received the fullness of the priesthood under the very hand of the Father after his trial in the wilderness, and he actually had a higher priesthood than all the rest. Uh, that's partly how he was able to do so many things that he did. Um, a part of that was because he was the only begotten of the Father, in that he was impreg or his father impregnated Mary, and he was part God, or part terrestrial, and part celestial. So, um, and I'm not going to get into uh, the differences between a terrestrial being and a celestial being. A celestial being cannot have children. And there's some deep doctrine there that I would love to go into. It's just not the time for it at this point. But um, it's interesting to note, though, um, there was a certain man back in the 70s who God – Revealed many things to And uh, he was Led and directed by God To uh, to many uh, Historical sites Where things had happened Now one of the sites that he was led to 
was uh, a hidden cave underneath the Holy of Holies. So when Solomon built the first temple, under the Holy of Holies, they had a system of, um, uh, what do you call it? It was like a, a, pneumatic, a pneumatic system where they could get the the Ark of the Covenant and everything in the Holy of Holies down underneath the temple and sealed into a place. And um, once again, it's been a while since I've studied all of this stuff, uh, but it's really fascinating. But um, Jeremiah's tombs, or I can't remember what it's called. Anyway, so this specific man, he went down into uh, to these caves underneath the Temple Mount, and the angel took him into a place that was really hard to get into because it was mostly sealed off, and the Ark of the Covenant is in that place. It's there still to this day. It's not in Somalia or Ethiopia or wherever people think it went because it disappeared right before Jeremiah uh, – you know, during the time of Jeremiah, it disappeared before the Babylonian captivity, and nobody knows where it's at. Well, the Jews in Israel, some of them know where it's at today because this man, Ron Wyatt, went down in there under the direction of an angel, and he was the only one that was allowed to touch it. And he was told to take a sample of the blood on the mercy seat to, uh, to uh, scientists, people who could test the blood. And it's really interesting. So when Yeshua, Jesus Christ, died, they had that earthquake. A crack opened up in the ground. And when they had the blood and water spilling forth from the the wound of Jesus, that water and that blood went down into the earth and right directly under the uh, place where he was crucified was where the Ark of the Covenant was put. And that blood of Yeshua sprinkled the mercy seat. When the when the uh the scientists who were orthodox Jews or I don't know if they were orthodox, but they were Jews, when they tested the blood they saw that the the chromosomes there was twenty four chromosomes. Now, normal human beings have 23 from the mother and 23 chromosomes from the father, but this had one chromosome from the father and 23 from the mother. Something else interesting, that dried blood that was on the mercy seat that they took a sample of, they reconstituted that blood, and they looked in the microscope, and it was still alive. His blood is still alive and it is a witness and a a testimony to all who know about it that Jesus was not just some ordinary rabbi that he was literally the son of the living God and his blood was st- is still alive after 2000 years and you know they asked Ron Wyatt, whose, whose blood is this? Because they knew it was ancient blood. They knew it was dried. It should have been dead. They didn't know whose it was. When Ron Wyatt told them this was Yeshua's blood, Jesus Christ's blood, that was on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant, they tore their clothing because they knew that their people had crucified the Son of the Living God, and that Jesus is exactly who He says He was, and He is exactly who He says He is, and He is still alive. His blood is still alive to this day that was spilt from the cross, and He is a living being to this day. And the reason why his blood is still alive because he was no ordinary man. He was literally the son of God. Continuing on. But knowing well the verses of the Old Testament and teaching higher principles did not fare well with others who became envious and jealous of this teacher. 
They cared less for him when he chastised them for quoting but not living the commandments and the law of the priesthood. They finally turned against him when he was teaching in one of the synagogues. The story is as recorded, and we are on page 198 for those of you who are reading along. And you can do that at ogdenkraut.com. Click on read Ogden's books on that main page and then scroll down to the church and the priesthood and then uh, control F for find and page if you're on a computer and go to uh, 198 and that's where we're at. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and his custom was he went into the synagogue on the Shabbat on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Now, who would do that? A rabbi would do that. He was a rabbi. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. That's Greek for Isaiah. So he was reading the book of Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord, or the spirit of Jehovah, is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, and hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. So he only read part of that that passage because the next part had not yet it wasn't time for that next part to be fulfilled. And it wasn't him that would do it. But whatever. All right. I'm still battling a cold, um, but hey, at least I can talk and it's not all nasally like happened one or two radio programs ago, but I have this problem <coughs> where I get into these coughing fits, and last night, my vision was going black, and I almost passed out, and I researched it on YouTube, because, <laughs> you know, Dr. YouTube and Rabbi Google know everything. So um, they, it said that uh, when that happens, uh, the blood going into your heart actually gets restricted, and your heart uh, pumps all the blood out, and your b- blood pressure drops so much that it causes the blood pressure to drop in your brain, and it causes you to pass out until your body regulates or you die. So they say it's a really, really rare thing that, um, that happens. I don't know, so I'm dealing with that. So I didn't even go to work last night. And it only happens when I'm really sick uh, or I'm recovering from something that was bad. So I was really sick, and I am still sick, but um, I'm getting better. So, all right, to preach the acceptable year of Jehovah or the Lord. He closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, to the minister, <laughs> And sat down in the eye. I'm sorry, it's just funny because in the Hebrew, that's not what it is. That's like an English word. It, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, and all, and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. Because You can't be a prophet. We don't accept prophets in this day, and it's the same thing in our day. If I tell you some of the things or reveal to you some of the revelations that God has revealed to me, people, they get upset that you're not an authorized person to receive revelation. It's really interesting because Brigham Young, who a lot of Mormons believe is a prophet, he stated, and I quoted, I quoted this and posted this on my YouTube, uh, my Facebook account, uh, which anybody who wants to follow me, facebook.com forward slash L-A-Z-U-R-U-S 1977. But I posted this quote of Brigham Young where he said, many people, I'm paraphrasing it, many people think that you have to be president of the church to be a prophet, seer, and revelator, and you don't. There's some other quotes that are like that, and I don't have them right now with me, but (laughs) – excuse me. God is no respecter of persons. God gives some people authority to do certain things, certain missions. But God chooses who he chooses to be prophets, seers, and revelators, even if nobody accepts them, like Jesus or Jeremiah or Isaiah. 
And people in Isaiah's day could say he was a false prophet because none of his prophecies came true during his life. But he was a true prophet, and nobody in his day accepted him. In fact, they put him to death for being a false prophet. Now, people that have the spirit and are not uh, don't have a bunch of preconceived notions about what a prophet is or who a prophet can be, they may have accepted Isaiah or Jeremiah or Jesus. But people who are so ensconced in their traditions, their religious traditions, they just reject it out of hand forthright. So, so these people were very angry at Jesus, and they thought, this guy thinks he's a prophet. <laughs> we got to get rid of him. So what did they do? They rose up and they thrust him out of the city. Luke chapter 4, verse 16 through 21 and 28 through 29. The Pharisees and chief priests became violently opposed to Jesus, and some of the instances of opposition were mentioned by Matthew. They said, quote, He casteth out devils through the prince of the devils. Uh, I think that's Matthew. Yeah, Matthew chapter 9, verse 34. He was called master of the house of Beelzebub. Matthew chapter 10, verse 25. He was a gluttonous and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. See, they're just trying to tear his name and reputation so nobody else would listen to him because they fear authority that they can't accept. Oh, he's a false prophet. Oh, he's a prophet of Satan. Oh, my gosh. Joseph Smith had to deal with that kind of junk in his day, and I have to deal with it in mine. Uh, so many people want to, like, throw... Uh, dispersions up at Joseph Smith and myself um, because we claim that we've seen God face to face, which we have. And people can't accept that because who am I? I'm some truck driver who has been homeless and had a really hard life, who loves God with all of his heart, who saw God face to face, his patriarchal blessing actually says I've been sealed up unto eternal life, which means I've already qualified to have my calling and election made sure and have received my second anointings, as well as the fullness of the priesthood under the hand of the Father. But people can't accept that because I'm just some nobody who wears black all the time and wears a cross. Uh, by the way, the reason I wear a cross, so after my mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I already had my CDL, and I went over the road to be a truck driver, partly because I wanted to, but partly because I was about to be homeless again. I had nowhere to go. I was 21. I got my CDL when I was uh, 18 because I was trained as a diesel mechanic, which I am not good at at all. <laughs> I'm so bad at being a diesel mechanic, but I'm an excellent driver. <laughs> so anyway, um, I was over the road completely 100% over the road from 1998 to 2003. And then um, I've gone over the road and done local stuff and worked in the oil field as a truck driver and a whole bunch of stuff over these last 20 something years. But I learned, I recognized that these Christians, I would observe people and I would try to present the gospel to people. I did a ton of missionary work. In fact, I would if there was a church that was close to a truck stop and there were people there, I was going there because I was going to talk to people, and I did. I went into many churches, and, like, I had fun. Okay, so I was fearless. Anyway, but I noticed that when Christians saw each other, they would see the cross, which is, you know, like this cross I'm wearing here. My kids are doing so. So my kids are home from school school today, which means they can watch the baby and I can do the radio show. So, all right. But anyway, but I noticed that when Christians saw each other, they would talk. So I thought to myself, self, if you have a cross, maybe you can talk to more people. And ever since then, ever since those days over the road back in 2000 and well, 98 to 2003, whenever it was I, did, I started doing I started wearing a cross, and I have not stopped wearing a cross to this day. And I use this to help to be able to talk to people. 
who are Christians about the gospel. And um, as the Spirit has led me, I have been able to bring many, many souls to receiving baptism by proper priesthood authority. And I still send people to the LDS church, even though they have cast me out and have uh, threatened me with trespass orders if I even talk to anybody on the property at, at the church where I used to go to. And in uh, well, we we went to a ward in Castledale, Utah. But so I still send people to the LDS church. Uh, if people want to be baptized by me, I do that as well, and I baptize many that way. But I think that the LDS Church is a good place to go. I think that there's a lot of good things within the LDS Church, even though they have rejected many things and changed ordinances and changed who Jesus and Jehovah is and just all a bunch of stuff since the beginning. That's why I do these radio shows. But so the Jews during that time or during the days of Jesus Christ and after, they used to go to the synagogues as well. But then they would meet together as believers on the night. Uh, when Shabbat was over on Saturday at sundown, at the begin- beginning of the new day, they would meet together. And that's why it talks about certain people falling from the rafters because they fell asleep because certain of those uh, disciples and apostles were very long-winded and people wanted to hear what they had to say and people would fall asleep, you know, and anyway. Um, but that's when they used to meet. It wasn't Sunday morning as as late, was later changed by the Catholic Church who – hijacked Christianity, but they would meet on Shabbat, on the Sabbath, on Saturdays with the Jews, and then they would meet together with the believers at the uh, the beginning of the first day of the week, which was Saturday night. So anyway, but let's continue on. Matthew chapter 12, verse 24 this fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. See, they, they just have to tear him down. And they do this and they do this today, and they did this in the days of Joseph Smith, so that people wouldn't listen to him or them. Satan's tactics are always the same. They're always the same. And it's unfortunate that people will listen to these liars who like don't even know Jesus or Joseph Smith or myself and and they want to cast dispersions and slander and the libel and all kinds of stuff so that people won't listen to them. Oh, he's just a false prophet. He's a pro or he is a prophet of the devil, you know. Anyway, they were offended in him Matthew chapter 13 verse 57. The Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying Matthew chapter 15 verse 12. He must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and scribes. Matthew 16, verse 21. The Pharisees also came up or came unto him, tempting him. Matthew 19, verse 3. We're on page 199 of the Church and the Priesthood for those of you following along. Continuing, quote, When the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, they were sore displeased. Matthew chapter 21, verse 15. Quote, when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parable, they perceived that he spake of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude. Matthew chapter 21, verse 45 to 46. Quote, then the Pharisees and uh, then. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. Matthew chapter 22, verse 15. You know, I'm kind of glad that they tried to do things like that for one reason. Because in his response to them, he taught us many things. And it's the same thing with Joseph Smith and myself. I don't usually compare myself to Joseph Smith and Jesus Christ, but it is what it is today, and that's just where it's going. But I enjoy, and I am worn out of responding to people. But before I got worn out of responding to people all the time that never will listen, um, I was fine with um, with answering people's questions and accusations. And the Spirit would help me to be able to write responses to them 
And the reason I was okay with that, even though they would never change their mind and I was always going to be a heretic and an apostate and a prophet of the devil and whatever else that they could throw at me, other people would read the response and they would uh, it would trigger uh, enlightenment within them and they would say, oh, wow, that makes sense. So these guys, these Pharisees and Sadducees and high priests and whatever that did what they did, God always used it to his benefit through his son, Yeshua, Jesus Christ. So anyway, continuing on. The chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. Matthew chapter 26, verse uh, three, and four, uh, 3 through 4. Quote, now the chief priests and the elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death. Matthew chapter 25, verse 59. In addition, John wrote about other charges and opposition that Jesus suffered. Quote, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. Let's see, is this Mark here? Oh, it's John, sorry. John chapter 1, verse 11. And see, that test that was to the Jews is the same test that the Ephraimites have with me. And I'm going to go off on a little tangent. But in uh, Joseph Smith history, when Moroni comes to the prophet Joseph Smith, he tells him that the man of Acts chapter 2, the man like unto Moses, is Messiah, but the day had not yet come when he would be rejected by his people. See, Jesus had already been rejected by the Jews. But the day had not yet come when he, this man like unto Moses, would be rejected by his people, but that day soon would come. Now, I've got a whole big old long note on this uh, where I go into depth uh, using many scriptures to show that this man of Acts chapter 2, the man like unto Moses, is Messiah ben Yosef, not Messiah ben Judah. Messiah ben Joseph, who was... Um, Messiah ben Ephraim, the son of Joseph. So Messiah ben Ephraim ben Yosef. So anyway, I, people can uh, that are my friends on Facebook, if you can find my notes, you can go in and find those. I would love to be able to share those. Uh, Facebook, for some reason, has made it so I cannot share those um, or copy them. Or, like, it's ridiculous. I don't – it's just – the devil fighting in any way he can to make sure that I don't uh, get my words out. But luckily, Blog Talk Radio is not controlled by Google or YouTube or whatever, and I can get my words out this way. So let's see. Continuing on, quote, Therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus because he had done these things on Shabbat, on the Shabbat day, our Sabbath day. John chapter 5, verse 16. Let me just see something. I'm going to see if I can call somebody here. I'm going to use the uh, – uh, okay, let's see. I can actually use my uh, <laughs> I can actually use my the studio, the radio studio to call certain numbers. So I'm trying to call my wife because it's her lunch. <laughs> Hello. Hi, you're on the radio show. Oh, that's why it says a New York number. I was like, what? You're like, sister. why is somebody calling from New York? Oh, yeah, because your yes. sister lived in New York. <laughs> yeah. It could have been your grandpa. Anyway, I'm but fine. I figured that I can use the studio to call people. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know if I can call out of country, but I know I can call in country. So I thought, well, she's on her lunch break, so she can listen if she'd like to. 
Are you yeah, busy? Yeah, I'm gonna. Yeah, I'm just gonna walk into the employee lounge and there'll be a whole bunch of people. So I'm gonna okay. do that really quickly, so just, and so I'll mute myself. Just mute it. Yes. Did um, are you, do you have your headset with you, or is it on? No, speaker? I don't. So unfortunately, yeah, I'll have to put it down. So. Okay. okay, that's fine. I will just uh, commentate, or I won't commentate. I'll just read. We're just reading okay. the scripture right now. So, all right, and then unmute yourself when you get into privacy. <laughs> okay, I will. Okay. All right. All right. Continuing on, we're in John chapter seven, verse one. He would not walk in Jewry because the Jews sought to kill him. John chapter seven, verse one. Also, quote, no man spake openly of him for fear of the Jews. John chapter 7, verse 13. Quote, then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him because his hour was not yet come. John chapter 7, verse 30. And like, no matter what Satan tried to do to kill Jesus, it wasn't his time yet, and they were not going to touch him. And uh, some of us, in this mortal existence have an actual appointed time of death and we can get hurt. We can get sick. A whole bunch of stuff can happen. But let me tell you, one of the reasons why my, my uh, Facebook account is Lazarus 1977 is because, well, there's stories I'm not going to go into it, but I have been shot at and stabbed and hung and poisoned and been in like what should have been, my death in, in car accidents and semi truck accidents, and I've been protected to the point where somebody uh, in Jersey City actually pulled his gun out, emptied his clip. Bullets flew so close to my face that I felt and heard the wisp of the bullet against my cheek. I wasn't touched. I stood there and watched this man pull his gun out and shoot at me when he lo- or when he ran out of bullets. I'll never forget this, but he pounded his chest and he said uh, something to the effect of, I will, I, I respect you because I didn't run because I didn't, I wasn't going to bow down to him. This guy who was probably doing some kind of gang initiation, but I've been shot at four times. I had a bullet hole right behind my head in my sleeper going through page Arizona bunch of drunk Indians. I think they were drunk because there was like whiskey bottles that stuff around their car parked on the side of the road uh, in a parking area just before you drop off this gorge south of Page on Highway 89. Anyway, they shot at my truck. They hit right behind my head. There was a bullet hole there. You know, and I've had other experiences where I've been stabbed or where um, I was coming off of Mormon Mesa near, uh, what's it called, Moapa, Nevada on I-15, where a car lost control going the other way. He was coming down from the Mesa. I was going up onto the Mesa, and he come flying across the, the median, and right before he hit me, I was about to T-bone him. He was, he was sliding sideways, and I had my hand on the steering wheel, and he hit an invisible wall in front of me and went flying back off into the median. He should, he should have been dead. I could have been dead. The only thing that happened was the rocks when he was sliding across the median. So in, in um, Nevada, it's desert. And where he came flying across, it was all rocks and gravel. And all these rocks came up and they shattered my window And my hands were on the top of the steering wheel, and I had glass shards in my knuckles and fingers, but nothing else happened to me. Because I have an appointment for a time to die, and God isn't going to allow it to happen. And that was the same thing that happened to Jesus Christ. And I believe that there are others out there who have a specific a mission in their life, and God is not going to allow them to die before it's their time. I believe that God won't allow anyone to die before it's their time, and if you do die, it's because it was your time to go. But but I know God protects, at least he protects me, and I know he protected Jesus as well. Ugh.
John chapter 8, verse 37. Ye seek to kill me because my words hath no place in you. John chapter 8, 48. Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast the devil. See, they're trying to destroy his reputation again. So people will not listen to him. This is the tactic of the adversary and the followers. And these people were good church members. They thought they were doing God a service by by exposing this heretic, Jesus. But what they were really doing was being a servant of Satan and trying to disparage and to slander Jesus and who he was and the message that he came to deliver to the people. And this is this is Satan's tactics. And people who do these things are doing Satan's tactics, whether they are in a church or not. People who slander other people with no evidence just try to disparage them at any cost. That's Satan's. That's how Satan does it. That's not how God does it. Continuing on, John chapter 8, verse 59. And then they took up stones to cast at him. See, they were trying to kill. So the ancient law of excommunication for heresy was to be stoned to death. So they were excommunicating him without a trial, by the way, which, you know, who cares about all the particulars of the rules that God has set forth. Let's just do it this way because we're angry and we we feel justified to kill this man who is a blasphemer and a heretic. At least that's what they thought. Little did they know. <laughs> anyway, Jesus says in John chapter 10, verse 33, for a good work we stone thee not. Oh, that's not Jesus. This is the Jews. Because Jesus is like, why do you stone me? What what do you, What have I done? And he says, for good work, we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. John chapter 10, verse 33. John chapter 11, verse 48. If we let him, if we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. John chapter 11, verse 48. So they cared more about their authority than they cared about God or following God's laws or receiving a prophet of Jehovah, our Elohim. So, <laughs> for the Jews, who knows if we have... I know we. I have Jewish followers, and so I'm, I'm directing this at everyone in the tribe of Israel, but for the Jews especially. Jehovah, our Elohim, sent many prophets before the destruction of the first temple to warn them to repent... And to warn them, they were about to be destroyed. He did the same thing right before the destruction of the second temple. He sent his very own son. And one of the greatest prophets, Yochanan the Immerser, John the Baptist. He also sent many other apostles who were also prophets. To warn the Jews to repent. And they wouldn't. Listen. Now, if God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, what other prophet can you point to that warned the people in that day, the same way Jeremiah warned the Jews of his day, that they were about to be rejected and cast out and destroyed? Jesus warned them. John the Baptist warned them. They were the two main prophets who came before the destruction of the second temple. But he also sent many apostles and other eyewitnesses that saw the resurrected Jesus Christ. And they wouldn't hear them. And in fact, they killed them. The Jews killed those people who were sent to warn the people to repent. They wouldn't hear it. Because they cared more about their traditions and their authority that, that they got from Rome than they cared about God. It was all a bunch of pomp and show to these people. We're on page 200. For those of you following along in the church and the priesthood. The Jews answered him, we have a law and by our law he ought to die because he made himself the son of God John chapter 19, verse 7. 
The Jews tried every possible way to trap or condemn Jesus, everything from eating with dirty hands, which is not part of the Torah. See, they have all these laws that they've added. So King Josiah was the worst. And you're not going to find this in history, but it is in the book of Lehi, which I have. Anyway, I know that's another topic altogether, but... In the book of Lehi, it talks about King Josiah, how when he found the temple scroll in the temple, the book of the law, that he got together with his Pharise- or with his councils, and they added many things to the Torah. So all these 613 laws that they say are in the Torah that we must all follow and obey and whatever, they were not – they were not – the these laws were not all given to Moses – by Yehovah. There were many things added. That's part of the reason they were destroyed. Why God allowed them to be to be destroyed. <coughs> but even after that, the Jews continued to add things. Even though in Deuteronomy 13 it says not to add to or take away from this law. That this law is for a perpetual are basically perpetual instruction throughout all eternity. I, I don't think it says all eternity, but it, it says certain general. It, anyway, it doesn't matter. You're not supposed to change the law that God gives you. So what do they come up with? They come up with this thing called the Mishnah or the Oral Torah, and they come up with the Talmud, and they come up with all of these man-made laws like you're not allowed to wash your hands and they'll even have this prayer that when they're washing their hands, and they have to do it a certain way if they're orthodox. And you have to recite this prayer, and in the prayer it says, as Jehovah has commanded us. But you can't find it anywhere in the Torah. Nowhere in the Torah. But they just add stuff, and they've been adding stuff through this Mishnah. But Josiah added things before the capto- captivity of the Babylonian uh, from the Jews, uh, whatever, from the Babylonians coming in and taking them all to, to Babylon. And we are still racked with these stupid laws that don't have anything to do with anything other than some some juvenile delinquent. Josiah was like 20-something when he died, 22 or something like that. Oh, I'm just going to add a bunch of stuff. Oh, I don't like I don't like certain things, so I'm going to add that in there, and I'm going to say this, and I'm going to say that, and it contradicts other parts, but then the Jews will, like, make all kinds of excuses, and, oh, well, it means this, and this is how you can see it in this way, and blah, 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 and it's ridiculous. That's why I don't keep kosher, because I believe many of those laws were added, and I know the whole thing about Jesus and Peter and the whole unclean, that was talking about the Gentiles, and if you actually do a little bit of study, just read on from that that whole vision that happened. It actually gives the interpretation, but most people are like, oh, this means it's okay to eat clean meats or dirty meats or whatever. (laughs) God values free agency to the point where he will allow everything to be destroyed by free agency. And I disagree with him on that. (laughs) But he's my God, and I will have to accept it, even though I disagree with it. All right, so, but they tried to condemn him for eating with dirty hands, which was not part of the Torah. But they want to say, oh, this is Moses. You're breaking God's laws by doing this, and it's not in the scriptures. Anyway, to, to talking with harlots. See, they were too good to talk to the common people. Too good. Oh, you horrible harlot. (laughs) Anyway, when they finally got him before a trial, they confessed, we have no king but Caesar. Because they did, did, everything was pomp and show to these people. They cared more about the kingdom of earth, the kingdom of Rome, than the kingdom of God. Same problem in our day. If we cared about the kingdom of God, we would be keeping the laws of God. Because the laws of God must be lived in order for Zion to be redeemed. But we as a people bow down to Babylon or the United States government who is supposed to protect our religious uh, beliefs and practices 
and they, they tell us we, we're not allowed to have united orders. We're not allowed to practice uh, plural celestial marriage, law of consecration, even though we all covenant to the, in the, the endowment, we all covenant to live the law of consecration. Nobody can live it. We don't have united orders. Even though the church has $126 billion in an investment account, which just came out like a couple weeks ago, maybe a month ago, that they don't use to do any charity work. In fact, the IRS is, is investigating them because $126 billion in an investment account marked as part of the 501c charity that they're just stockpiling, that's not, I, that's not good. <laughs> you know, they should have been using that money to create United Orders, but they don't care about God's instruction that he gave to us through the prophet Joseph Smith, that he restored through the prophet Joseph Smith, just like they didn't care back in the days of Jesus Christ about prophets, and they didn't care about following God's correct instruction. And they rejected that prophet, Jesus, the same as they rejected Joseph Smith. And they reject Joseph Smith in the church and out of the church, because you can go to the Doctrine and Covenants and find a whole bunch of stuff that the church isn't doing today that God gave us through the prophet Joseph Smith that we should be doing in order for Zion to be redeemed. Anyway. So they had no king but Caesar, and we have no king but the United States government. John chapter 19, verse 15. I'm and sorry, committed I themselves to the laws of the land rather than the laws of God. Go ahead, Kim. Well, I was um, coming in at the last part of that, and I was just wondering where – is there a place that you can read about that for, like, what the church was doing with the money and all that stuff, or no? Oh, um, I haven't really been posting them in my groups, but I've, I've seen articles on them, and I can I can tag you in them when I see them okay. again. I'm just so, interested in church- – that whole thing and what news is reporting on it or what is not because if people don't see it then they don't know they're kept in the dark and so well I I'm know, just but you know even if they do see it they'll just be like oh some evil heretic is attacking the church and nothing that they say is true because this guy is a whistleblower and you know how they are but mm-hmm. you understand that a lot of people yeah, will reject it even if, even if there's all this evidence and they are persecuted like it's like with Warren Jeffs the FLDS even though they all this stuff happened and they got him dead to rights and he's in life for prison in prison for life, they're they're like, oh nope, he's the prophet. We're just gonna follow him, and it's the same kind of mentality in the Mormon Church. So but yeah, um, I think on Latter Day Unity, people have talked about it, and that's uh, for those of you listening. That's one of the groups on Facebook that I admin. Okay. Did you have any other questions, Kim? No, I was just curious about that. That would be something I'd like to read about. Okay. But yeah, I think they're supposed to have transparency when it comes to all of that. Yeah, they're supposed to, but they don't. They don't care. And, in fact, it took a whistleblower who worked in church accounting to expose uh, expose it. And the church at first tried to, de- to deny it. And now the church put out a press release basically saying, that they were saving that money for the millennium. What part of money a money system are you going to need with greenbacks in the millennium? Like it's just these Babylonian businessmen that have taken hijacked the church and the kingdom of God on the earth. But anyway, um, I'm going to put you back on the headset so there's better audio. I put you on speaker so that um, the people on the video could hear what you were saying. Oh, okay. So. If you have any other questions, just let me know, and I'll put you back on speaker, okay? Okay. All right. Let's see. We're going to continue on with the reading. Any man being charged with all of these allegations by the councils of the Pharisees and the chief priests would not be able to remain long in the membership of their church. There is a story related in the night that in chapter 9 of the book of John that gives us a good insight into the subject of excommunication. 
The following account is a modern version taken from the Living Bible published by Tyndale House Publishers, Wheaton, Illinois. This version was also published by Cloverdale House Publishers in London, England. All right. <clears throat> Let's see here. Okay, this is the quote. As he was walking along, he saw a man blind from birth. Master, his disciple asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it a result of his own sin or those of his parents? Neither, Jesus answered, but to demonstrate the power of God, all, all of us must quickly carry out the tasks assigned us by one who sent me. Therefore, there is little time left before the night falls and all work comes to an end. But while I am still here in the world, I give it my light. Then he spat on the ground and made mud from the spittle, which was against the Mishnah and the Talmud and whatever. It was against these oral laws. It had nothing to do. Oh, how dare you mix mud because you're working on the Sabbath. Oh, it drives me nuts. So Jesus, he, he spits and, and makes some mud. And he smoothed the mud over the blind man's eyes and told him, go and wash in the pool of Shalom. The word uh, Siloam means sent. So the man went where he was sent and washed and came back seeing. All right. So there's two things. There's what Ogden's trying to use the scripture to show. And then there is also the disciples had an understanding of reincarnation or, or multiple mortal probations, which was once taught in the church. Did this man sin being born blind or was it some, uh, his parents sin? Okay. How can you sin before you're born? Unless for two things, there is multiple mortal probations or preexistence, a preexistence of spirits. So one of the things that, that Chris and Doug, they don't understand that, that God created us all spiritually before he created us physically, that we lived with God in the heavens in the Shamaim before, before we came to this earth. The whole thing about Jeremiah, I knew you before I put you in the womb. They say, oh, yeah, God knows everything that he's going to do, but that doesn't mean Jeremiah actually existed. Well, how could this man sin before he was born if he did not exist? Okay, that's just one thing, but let's get back to what Ogden was trying to show. We're going to continue reading the scripture. His neighbors and others knew him as a blind beggar, asked each other, is this the same fellow that that beggar? or that blind man who was born blind. Some say yes, and some say no. It can't be the same man, they thought. But he surely looks like him. And the beggar said, I am the same man. He, in that day, like the part of the, the, the Pharisees had this, this thing. You have, the only way you can tell a prophet is a prophet is someone who, or not a prophet, uh, a Messiah is someone who, killed a man born blind because that can't happen. Also, somebody who raises somebody from the dead after the third day, that can't happen. So that must be a prophet, all right? <coughs> so this is evidence. This man being born blind, being killed and given sight is evidence that Jesus is a Messiah. All right. And they asked him how in the world he could see what happened. And, and he told them, a man they called Jesus made mud and smothered it over my eyes and told me to go to the pool of Siloam and wash off the mud. I did, and I can see. Well, where is he now, they asked. I don't know, he replied. Then, then they took the man to the Pharisees. Now, as it happened, this all occurred on the Sabbath. See, Oh, you know, Jesus heals a man born blind, but they're going to flip out because he made some mud in the dirt with his spit. Because it was on the Sabbath, and you're not supposed to, like you, in, in Orthodox Judaism, you can carry your mattress all over the house on the Sabbath, and it's not a big deal. The, the minute you walk outside with it, oh my gosh, you've got to be stoned to death for breaking the Sabbath. You know, you can, if you push an elevator button on the Sabbath, 
you're using electricity, so you're breaking the Sabbath. So in New York and other places where there's a lot of Jews, the elevators on Sabbath or Shabbat will stop at every floor. So they're still using the electricity, but that little act of pushing that elevator button, oh, you're, you're breaking the Sabbath because you're working by pushing the elevator button. Or, or even you can't have um, – you can't kindle a fire on the Sabbath. So if your fire goes out and you're going to freeze to death and you break the Sabbath by trying to light a fire – you can be excommunicated and punished for that, but but you can die, and they don't care about that. I, well, I guess there is a provision for that if your life is in jeopardy. But, like, you're, you're not even allowed to turn your car on because that's kindling a fire in the cylinders where the fire – so <laughs> I don't know. We'll see what they do with the whole um, electric car thing because you're not kindling – I don't know. They, they drive me nuts. But they still do the same thing. Orthodox Jews are the Pharisees that Jesus had to deal with. They're the same as they always have been. They add many things to the scriptures, and then they try to condemn people and excommunicate them. And they were worse back then because they could actually kill people and get away with it. So uh, now as it happened, all this occurred on the Sabbath. Then the Pharisees asked him all about it. So he told them how Jesus had smooth, smothered, smoothed the mud over his eyes, and then when it was washed away, he could see. Some of them said, then this fellow Jesus is not from God because he is working on the Sabbath. He healed a man born blind. But because he mixed some spit in his hand with, uh, with some mud, some dirt, He's a prophet of the devil. They find any excuse to reject the true prophets. They did then, and they do now. Others said, but how could an ordinary sinner do such a miracle? So there was a deep division of opinion among them. Then the Pharisees turned on the man who had been blind and demanded, this man who opened your eyes, who do you say he is? I think he must be a prophet sent from Jehovah, our Elohim, or from God, the man replied. The Jewish leaders wouldn't believe he had been, been blind until they called his parents and asked them, Is this your son? Was he born blind? If so, how can he see? The parents replied, We know this is our son and that he was born blind, but we don't know what happened to make him see or who did it. He is old enough to speak for himself. Ask him. See, and they don't even care that he was really born blind. They're doing it to, to, to call this man a liar. Oh, he said he was born blind, but he's not. He's just a liar. That's the only reason that they called the parents out. All right, the parents are scared because... They could be excommunicated for for supporting Jesus as a Messiah or a prophet or saying that he actually did these healings, right? They said this in fear of the Jewish leaders who had announced that anyone saying Jesus was the Messiah, anyone saying that Jesus was the Messiah would be excommunicated. We're on page 202. So for the second time, they called in the man who had been, been blind and told him, Give the glory to God, or Jehovah our Elohim, because that's the name of God, our Father, our Grandfather anyway, not to Yeshua, or Jesus, for we know Jesus is an evil person. <coughs> I don't know whether he is good or bad, the man replied, but I know this. I was born, I was blind, and now I see. But what did he do, they asked. How did he heal you? Look, the man exclaimed, I told you once and you didn't listen, because they don't care. They don't care. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Oh, they ripped their their clothes at that point. How dare you, blasphemer? (laughs) Then they cursed him and said, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses, Moshe. We know that Jehovah has spoken to Moshe, but as for this fellow, We do not know anything about him. Why? That's very strange, the man replied. 
He can heal blind men, and yet you don't know anything about him. Well, God doesn't listen to evil men, but he has, listened, he has opened the ears to those who worship him and do his will. Since the world began, there was never anyone, anyone who could open the eyes of someone born blind. If this man were not from God, he could not do it. You illegitimate bastard, they shouted talking to this this guy, right? And they called Jesus an illegitimate bastard as well. You are trying to teach us, and they threw him out, because they they are elders that know too much to be taught. Same thing happens in our church today. People who think that they have authority are too wise to be taught, to be corrected. Same thing happens. You're going to teach us? Oh, we're going to teach you. We're going to kick you out, right? And that's what they do. That's what they did to him. They do it to people today. Anyone who raises questions or confronts or like the Adam God doctrine or plural celestial marriage or the law of adoption or any of these things, they'll kick you out in an instant because they're the authority and you're not to question them. And in their arrogance, like like Dallin H. Oaks did uh, and does. Even if you're wrong, you're you're not supposed to criticize us. If you're doing something wrong and it is against Scripture, you need to have that pointed out. And then you can explain to us why is it that you do that, you know, and use it as a teaching moment. These people, they don't care. Their authority, your blind allegiance, that's all they care about. When Jesus heard what had happened, he found the man and said, do you believe in the Messiah? Or Mashiach. The man answered, Who is he, sir? I want to. Jesus said, You have seen him, and he is speaking to you right now. Yes, I don't know. The man said, I believe, and he worshiped Jesus. Then Jesus told him, I have come into the world to give sight to those who are spiritually blind. And to show those who think that they who think they see that they are blind, John chapter nine. As an interesting sidelight from J. R. Dermlo, I'm sorry, Dumlo Bible Commentary, Volume One, page seven hundred ninety. It elaborates. We're on page two hundred three. Excuse me. The whole section illustrates the incredible blindness of the Pharisees who can see nothing in this unique sign except the technical breach of the Sabbath, of which they suppose Jesus to have been guilty. Verse 14, the conduct of Jesus was was illegal in two ways. One, it was forbidden to render medical aid on the Sabbath unless there was immediate danger or death. And you know what? This... These things were added to Torah by Josiah. Yeah, they were against that Torah, but not to the simple Torah that God gave to Moses on the mountain. They were additions. The Babylonian Talmud, or the Babylonian Tanakh, it's not the same as the one that was before it. There were many things that were added during the reign of King Josiah. According to the book of Lehi, and I believe it, there was a special provision against applying saliva to the eyes on the Sabbath day. (laughs) So if you get something in your eye and you don't have any water and you use your fingers to get that thing out of you, that's breaking the Sabbath because you're working on the Sabbath, right? Anyway, that's verse 17. He is a prophet. This view, if accepted, would remove the difficulty about the Sabbath day, for it was generally supposed that prophets had authority over the Sabbath law, verse 22, and that they would be put out of the synagogue, or in other words, excommunicated. It is interesting to compare John chapter 9, verse 22 from the King James Bible that with that passage from four other Bibles. Okay, this is a little bit irritating to me to have to read this. I'm going to do it, but it's a lot of repetition. 
because we're going to go over the whole thing again four times, and I don't want to. <laughs> I, I, whatever. But we're going to do it. So I'll try to read fast. <laughs> These words spake. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. King James Bible. Bible. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed him to be Christ should be excommunicated. That was why his, the man's parents said, he is of age, ask him. James Moffat, Moffat Bible. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews who had already agreed that anybody who admitted that Christ had done the, these things should be excommunicated. It was this fear which made his parents say, ask him, he is a grown-up man. Philip's Modern Bible Dictionary, or English Bible. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews who had already agreed that anyone, anybody who had admitted that this man was Christ should be excommunicated. It was with, it was this which made his parents say, ask him, he is a grown-up man. J.B. Phillips' Modern English New Testament. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah. yeah, this is going to have to be a two-part program because we're not even halfway through the reading. And we only got 43 minutes left on the live stream. Now, I can continue on and do the whole three hours. And I might just do that. I think I can get through the whole chapter in three hours, but that is a long, long chapter. So we'll see where I am. Um, doing these radio programs really takes a lot of time for me. And uh, it eats into uh, my work and other things that I would like to do. Um, I do these because God has commanded me to do these things. And if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be doing these anymore. I, I, I struggle. Uh, I sh I've been struggling with the website, with all of the websites that I've done over the years. Uh, I've struggled with all kinds of stuff. Um, taking the time out to do these actually eats into how many loads I can get. It takes time to set up for it. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to do it because God told me to. So, um, and I don't, I don't, I don't get anything financially for it. And I'm tired of arguing with people. And I just want to be left alone and live on my little farm that I have here. And to stop having so many issues because of my beliefs and my my religion or whatever. <laughs> but I'll do it. I'll continue because God tells me to. But um, I'm just tired of it all, really. I really am. I not having a lot of support or hardly any at all. I'm just worn out. And people don't listen, so I mean, some people listen, but I'm just to the point where I don't care anymore. And I'm sorry. I wish I did. I, I it might have something to do with not being able to fellowship with people who are at least a little bit like-minded. I mean, I really love the Pentecostal church that my wife and I go to when I can go. I. I miss being around people who believe the Book of Mormon. And I hate it when people know that I proclaim to be a prophet because then they get all stupid around me and I just want to be one of the guys, right? <laughs> I don't know. His parents gave this answer because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jewish authorities had already agreed that anyone who acknowledged Jesus as Messiah should be banned from the synagogue. That is why the parents said, he is of age, ask him. New English Bible. Note the use of the term excommunicated or banned in the above four biblical passages. 
it was common for Bible scholars to interpret <laughs> this passage from John as referring to excommunication. Several excerpts from Bible commentaries will further prove that this is the case. New commentary in the whole Bible. The healed man's condemnation of Pharisees, irrational rejection of Jesus. Um, chapter 9, verses 9 through 33, proved too much for them to take, so they excommunicated or de synagogued him from the synagogue with a curse about his presumed guilt from birth. <laughs> Adam, Adam Clark's commentary. Adam Clark was a learned English Bible scholar, renowned for his profound understanding of the Bible. To put out of the synagogue, that is, excommunicated, separated from all religious connection with those who, wor- who worshipped God, Volume 1, page 557. Same thing happens today if you if you don't go right along with whatever, then that's part of the reason why I like why I like the idea of my church. I know God told me to uh start the Church of the Living Messiah and the School of the Prophets and I considered a non-denominational brand of Mormonism where people can not, they don't have to worry about <laughs> being kicked out for <laughs> excuse me um, for having differing opinions. You know, you don't have to be a sycophant to be a member of the Church of the Living Messiah. There's things you can't do, and I have excommunicated people for certain things. But like it's like in Latter Day Unity, my group and my group. Um, LDS Last Days Prophecy and Gospel Discussions or LDS Gospel Mysteries. I allow anybody who believes in Mormonism to be part of those sites to post. Even if I don't agree with it, even if it drives me a little bit nuts, some of these posts that these people put on to these webs, uh, these Facebook pages, I still allow it because they're believing Mormons. And so I call it non-denominational Mormonism because I'm not going to worry about whether you um, know that the prophet here and revelator of the LDS church or whatever is the prophet. I don't even care. Some people believe that Denver Snuffer is the new prophet here and revelator. Some people believe I am the prophet here and revelator. I don't care. What I care about is the gospel and what was taught and restored by the prophet Joseph Smith. And I I care about the correct interpretation of scripture. Uh, All right. Continuing on. Peake's, Peake's commentary on the Bible. The blind man with growing boldness, expressed his surprise that the religious leaders of the nation should be so ignorant about one to whom God has given such power. Even the unlearned know that God does not favor sinners, but only his true worshipers. At this retort, they degenerate into mere mere abuse and drive the men out, an action with which the author probably interprets as excommunication <clears throat> in the light of later history um, oh yeah okay so we're on page 205 now I'm going to make a part two of this video uh, on my recording I've got to go to the bathroom real quick so I'm going to put on one of the only audio clips I can figure out how to get off my computer under the radio show, but it's talking about the King Full at Discourse, Discourse Part 1. It's only 4 minutes and 30 seconds. But I think that's going to give me enough time to actually go to the bathroom. So I will let you guys sit here and listen to that. If I can. 
this office is so small that I have to make sure the chair can go underneath the thing in order for me to open up the door to get out of the office. So I'm going to do that at this, at this time. <coughs> and uh, I'll be right back. Hey, welcome to this YouTube video. Uh, we are going to be talking about the uh, the King Pullet discourse uh, today. Um, I am Mark Lichten Walter, the second witness and prophet of the Father, um, an apostle of the Father, in fact. Um, I did see our Father uh, in the flesh in the spring of 2003, and this is uh, Samuel. Yeah, Sam, I'm Samuel Warren Schaefer, also known as Frederick. Um, I have gotten lots of experience. I've had lots of experiences with spiritual things that have led me up to this point of um, uh, joining forces with uh, Mark here. And um, I am a seer, and I've had a, a, like a few experiences which um, have prepared me for the calling of being the patriarch of the church. I was ordained here by Mark. So. Yeah. So and and he has received many, many wonderful uh, visions and translations of scripture that have not um, mm -hmm. seen the light of day for a long, long time. Anyway, so, um, but uh, in the King Follett Discourse, this was a, um, a discourse that was actually the last discourse that was fully given by Joseph Smith. There was one that was given just after. Um, Called the uh, Discourse from the Grove. That discourse um, was his last discourse, but it was interrupted by the rain, so he only gave a partial discourse. This is this uh, the King Cole discourse is the second to last discourse Joseph Smith ever gave, and it, the last full discourse. He gave. Yeah, and it, this discourse was not published to the church until after the death of Joseph Smith, so a mm -hmm. lot of people didn't even they may have known about it, but they couldn't really. If they were there. Yeah, so. Um, it, it deals with uh, the nature of God, creation, all kinds of really wonderful things. And we thought we would just uh, really like get into it and uh, give commentary on each section, uh, which in the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, um, there's many sections of the King Paul Discourse. Um, so we're just going to go through it step by step and give our commentary. My wife, uh, who does not want to be on camera, is reading. She's really good at reading, so and we're really grateful for her to do that. And anyway, we'll just uh, get into it. I'm going to uh, dedicate the program. And is there anything that you wanted to say? No, go ahead. Of? Okay, and then after I dedicate the program, Kim will read the first uh, two sections, the, the introduction and the first section. So, all right. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. <coughs> Father, we come to thee in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. We ask thee, Father, to bless this, uh, this discussion that thy spirit might be with us. We dedicate this uh, our lives unto thee as we have done in the past, we will do in the future. We dedicate this program, this video, unto thee, and we love thee, Father. We thank thee for thy Son, Jesus Christ, and for atoning for our sins. We thank thee, Father, for showing us truth and giving us further light and knowledge concerning thy plan for us and the truth of the eternities. We love thee, Father, and we love thy Son, Jesus Christ, and we also love thy Son, Joseph Smith. We desire to be thy servant. We ask thee, Father, to help us to be tools of thine hand to bring about thy kingdom, that thy kingdom in heaven would uh, dwell and re reign on earth. We love thee, Father, and we say these things in the name of the Messiah. Amen. Amen. The King Paul at this course. The being and kind of being God is, the immortality of intelligence of man, by Joseph Smith the prophet. <laughs> Presiding Joseph Smith delivered the following discourse, or, I'm sorry, President Joseph Smith delivered the following discourse before about 20,000 saints at the April Conference of the Church in 1844, being the funeral sermon of Elder King Follett, recorded by Willard Richards, Wilford Woodruff, Thomas Bullock, and William Clayton. This discourse was first published in the Times and Seasons. Okay. 
Okay, I gotta go. Alright. Here is back on this headset. All right, so part two, uh, we're going to uh, continue reading the uh, 12th chapter of the Church and the Priesthood, Excommunication of Jesus Christ. We're about halfway through it. I don't know if there'll be a part three or not, but we'll do what we can. Uh, for anybody who does want to uh, chat with me um, while I'm doing the reading, uh, you can go to blogtalkradio.com forward slash fundamentally Mormon and uh, there's a chat room there on this live radio program the guest call in number for people who want to listen or people who want to ask questions is 917-889-8827 and we are also live streaming on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash user forward slash God is my compass we are on page 205 of chapter 12 of the Church and the Priesthood, and uh, we'll continue on with the reading. Uh, Layman's Bible Book Commentary. The reason for the parents' strange reaction was that the Jewish leaders had already decided that anyone confessing Jesus as the Messiah would be excommunicated from the synagogue. Matthew Henry's Commentary. If anyone should show it, I think, yeah, okay. So this is Matthew Henry's commentary. If anyone should show himself a disciple of Jesus, he should be deemed and taken as an apostate from the faith of the Jewish church and a rebel and a traitor against the government of it and should therefore be put out of the synagogue as one that had rendered himself unworthy of honors of (laughs) and incapable of the privileges of their church he should be excommunicated and expelled from the commonwealth of Israel. Note, the church's artillery, when when the command of it has fallen into ill hands, has often been turned against itself, and ecclesiastical censures have been made to to sever a carnal secular interest. There is no new thing to see those cast out of the synagogue that were were the greatest ornaments and blessings uh, uh, blessings of it. And that's uh, that commentary, volume 5, page 1017. In Holman's New Testament comment, commentary on this subject, it says, if this portion of chapter 9 ended at verse 21, we could see a normal par- parental reaction spoken in truth and frankness. But John wanted his readers to know that there was a motivating fear, the pressure of excommunication. He also explained that all, that already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ or the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue or excommunicated. Many interpreter, interpreters suggest that since we know Christians worshipped in synagogues in the book of Acts, John must have been reading back into the text the rulings of a later day, but that may be attributing more to the text than John intended. Remember, he was not concerned with formal rulings of the Sanhedrin, but the hostility of the religious leaders. I I agree with Borkert. From my perspective, therefore, the statement as contained in 9 verse 22 would be reflective of the hostile context in the time of Jesus. After all, Jesus was indeed regarded as the enemy, as an enemy of the Jewish authorities. And that's Borkert, page 320. From the modern perspective, we can hardly imagine this horror, the horror of excommunication in Jesus' time. Such a ban would curse these people forever from the religious lives of their communities. The defense of an unknown prophet, even one great enough to heal their blind son, hardly seemed worth such a risk. To avoid such punishment, the parents threw the burden of proof back on their son. And in that day, you could be killed for being excommunicated. 
just like in the days of Brigham Young. Brigham Young did the same thing to apostate, to dared to to say anything different than what you know. You could be excommunicated for believing for for not believing the Adam God doctrine. Uh, today you can be excommunicated for believing the Adam God doctrine. But if you're considered an apostate back in the time of Jesus or Brigham Young, you could be put to death for it. It's the same crap that um, that they believed in with the, the Sanhedrin, the the blood atonement, whatever that that Brigham Young believed in. So, <clears throat> in the pulpit commentary, that if any man should confess that he was Christ. He is remarkable. It shows how full the thoughts of the evangelists were of the personality of Jesus. He should be put out of the synagogue or become unsynagogued. In Matthew Poole's commentary, it says, The reason why his parents answered so very rarely and avoided saying anything to the Pharisees' third question, which they they could uh, probably they could not not do of their particular personal knowledge, was that they were afraid of the rulers of the Jews. Solomon says, The fear of man bringeth a snare. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25. Yeah, verse 25. It is often a temptation to men to deny the truth, or at least not to own and confess it when God calls them for a public owning and confession of it. But nothing of that nature appear, appeareth in this case, for it doth not appear that his his parents were present when Christ wrought this great miracle, <clears throat> which if they were not, they were not obliged to tell the Pharisees what they themselves only received by rumor and hearsay, so that their answer seemed but a, a prudent answer to avoid the in intimate danger, for they were not ignorant of the decree made by the Jewish Sanhedrin, that if any did publicly say or declare that Jesus was Christ or the Messiah, he should be excommunicated, for that that is meant by being put out of the synagogue. And that is uh, that commentary, uh, volume 9, page 327. We are on page 207 of The Church and the Priesthood by Ogden Kraut, Chapter 12, The Excommunication of Jesus and His Believers. You can read what uh, the com or the the you know what I'm reading uh, by going to ogdenkraut.com, which there's a link in the iTunes, and there is a link in the uh, the Blog Talk Radio audio on the uh, description of the program to take you to the book that we're reading at ogdenkraut.com. Uh, if you're watching on the video on the YouTube or whatever, wherever you find this, you can go to ogdenkraut.com forward slash, well, ogdenkraut.com will take you to the main page. Click on read Ogden's books and then scroll down to the church and the priesthood. We're on page 207. Zondervan's Bible Commentary, the New International Version, the NIV Version, which I hate, because they the, the people who translated that, they did not believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. So anywhere that it suggests anything about the deity of Yeshua or Jesus, they just got rid of it. If they didn't agree with something, they just got rid of it. They're almost as bad as the, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses. You know, they, there's sections of the Jehovah's Witnesses Bible Chapters are gone. Oh, we don't agree with this. We're just going to delete it. The new, uh, the NIV version does the same. Not as bad as Jehovah's Witnesses, but the evidence was still insufficient to remove the objection of the Jews, a phrase here synonymous with the Pharisees. They proceeded to query whether the man had really been born blind, for if he had not been born blind, are blind from birth, the miracle could be disputed. See, that's all they care about. Well, we're going to dispute this miracle, you know, because only, only somebody from God can heal a man born blind according to their own ideas. Only a man from God could do this. So so that's what they're, they're attacking, these, these 
uh, Sadducees and these Pharisees, that's what they're going after, right? They also interrogated his parents who, fearing excommunication from the synagogue, evaded the, the issue by stating that their son was an adult capable of answering for himself. Bible Exposition Commentary <clears throat> What lay behind all of this questioning and these furtive, furtive replies? <laughs> the fear of the people. We meant it as the Feast of Tabernacles, John chapter 7, verse 13. And we shall meet it again at our Lord's last Passover, John chapter 12, verse 42. These people were seeking the honor of men and not the honor that comes from God. John chapter 5, verse 44. Same thing with our day. If you know that certain things in the gospel were restored and that they are true, do you fear God or do you fear the church? Are you going to live God's law or are you going to, are you going to be obedient to man's law? In order for us to be uh, to receive the highest blessings, we must be obedient to God's higher laws, and that's not going to be worked out by some imaginary thing after this life. You do it today, or you don't do it at all. But that's what the scriptures say. That's what I believe. So, these people were seeking the honor of men and not the honor that comes from God. John chapter five verse forty four. To be sure. It was a serious thing to be excommunicated from the synagogue, but it was far more serious to reject the truth and be lost forever. Jameson, Fan, Fancott, and Brown, Brown's commentary, they, speaking of the parents, prevaricated, however, in saying they knew not only they knew not who had opened his eyes, for they feared the Jews who had come to an understanding probably after what is recorded in chapter 7, verse uh, 50. But by this time well known that whoever owned him as the Christ would be put out of the synagogue, or in other words, simply ex not simply ex excluded or not simply put on uh, uh, what they call it, disfellowshipment, but actually excommunicated. <coughs> Believer's Bible Commentary, verse 22, explains the timidity of the parents. They had heard that any man confessing that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. This excommunication was a very serious matter for any Jew. Bible Knowledge Commentary. But the parents were afraid to hazard any opinion about the cure or the healer. The Pharisees and other Jews, Jewish authorities, the Jews, had already decided that Jesus was not the Messiah. Those because how could the Messiah be born a bastard? Like, that was one of their comments. Like, Mary wasn't married to Joseph, and he was a bastard. Which, you know that they that they thought that of him, because they actually said, you know, things that would, uh, if you know what they're talking about, that you would understand that that's what they thought of him. How could this bastard be a prophet? Those who held such heresy would be excommunicated from the synagogue. The homiletic commentary by Reverend Frank Scott. The Jews had agreed, etc. The Sanhedrin had not likely come openly to this agreement. They would have found opposition in their own ranks. A party of leading sects had done so. However, in Acts chapter 23, verse 20, um, put out of the synagogue, publicly excommunicated from participation in all religious privileges for a time or for life. The Desire of the Ages by Ellen White. She is a prophetess of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Not the one that started it, but the one that saved it after their prophecy failed. So at least they worship on the proper Sabbath day and not this Roman hijacked Sabbath that that most of the rest of the world worship on. But Ellen White, a Bible scholar and pro prolific author and defender of the Seventh-day Adventist, explained that although the blind man was excommunicated for believing in Christ, he was later rewarded with a higher revelation. The blind man had met his inqui inquisitors 
on their own ground. His reasoning was unanswerable. The Pharisees were astonished, and they held their peace, spellbound before his pointed, determined words. <clears throat> For a few moments, there there was silence. Then the frowning priests and rabbis gathered about them, them their robes. And though they feared contamination from contact with him, they shook off the dust of their feet and hurled denunciations against him. Thou wast altogether born in sin, and dost thou teach us? Why? Because he was born blind? So he's a sinner because he's born blind. And they excommunicated him. Desire of the Ages, page 428. Note, it is obvious from John's record that the blind man was excommunicated from the church of Moses. If they cut him off, the church for defending Jesus, there must have been many others who are excommunicated for the same reason. Albert Barnes' commentary. Albert Barnes explained that there was two kinds of punishment for offenders. One a sort of disfellowshipment, and the other an excommunication. We're on page 209 for those of you following along. Put out of the synagogue. This took place in the temple or near the temple. It does not refer, therefore, to any immediate or violent putting forth from the place where they were. It refers to excommunication from the synagogue. Among the Jews, there were two grades of excommunication, the one for lighter offenses, of which they mentioned 24 causes, the other for greater offenses. The first excluded a man from 30 days from privilege of entering a synagogue and from coming near to his wife or friends, near to his wife and friends in four cubits, because there are a bunch of priest crafters. The other was a solemn exclusion forever from the worship of the synagogue. Attended with awful maledictions and curses and exclusion from all intercourse with the people. This was called the curse until so thoroughly excommunicated or excluded a person from all communication, whatever with their, his countrymen, that they, they were not allowed to sell anything, sell to him, him anything, even the necessities of life. This was all of their added crap that they added to the Torah, because you can't find this in Torah. The church today does it. The church back then did it. It's the same downward slope, the same apostasy taking place in every dispensation. Continue. It is probable that this Latter-day punishment was that they intended to inflict if anyone should trust that Jesus was the Messiah, volume 9, page 281, Mormon scholar Daniel Ludlow stated, he should be put out of the synagogue is the equivalent of he should be excommunicated from the church, the four gospels, page 397. Mormon scholar Bruce R. McConkie, who is also a so-called apostle in the Brighamite church, verse Okay, put out of the synagogues, excommunicated, doctrinal, uh, Doctrine New Testament Commentary, Volume 1, page 481. Noted scholar John Lightfoot, who is also LDS from the Bergamite tradition, agrees that in translation from the original Greek to Hebrew, the word excommunication should be used in many Bible passages rather than cast out, etc. Page 210, verse 20. Uh, 22. He should be put out of the synagogue. So in chapter 16, 2, I don't know, some weird stuff here. Granted that this is spoken of excommunication, the question may be whether it is to be understood of ordinary excommunication, that is, from this or that synagogue, or extraordinary, that is, a cutting off from the whole congregation of Israel or even your life. Whoever is excommunicated by, I don't know why it does that. The president of the Sanhedrin it is cut off from the whole congregation of Israel. And if so, that then much more, if it be by the vote of the whole Sanhedrin, and it seems by that speech that they cast him out, version, 
verse 34, that that word out was added for such significance. I don't know why. They've got like this weird star thing in brackets as they're replacing the word. I don't know what that word is. And I'm not going to take the time to go into these books behind me and figure out which book it's in. So... <laughs> Let's see here. Commentary commentary on the New Testament from the Talmud and Hebraica, volume 3, page 344. It is important to keep in mind that definitions and close relationships of these terms for later discussions on this topic. If Christ's disciples and believers were threatened with, with excommunication, then certainly Christ himself must have also feared for his membership, church membership, even though he was a rabbi. The Jewish leaders would not cut off members from the church for believing in Jesus and then still keep him in the church. The popularity of Jesus was a thorn in the side of the Pharisees. It was not only the common folks that believed in him, but even many uh, community leaders. Many of the rulers of the Jews became convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. However, they did not dare to share their conviction with the others, lest they be excommunicated. Zonder Van's New, uh, New International Version commentary. See also Zonder Van's, Zonder Van's Encyclopedia of the Bible, page or volume two, page four twenty two and four twenty three. I actually have those encyclopedias, but I guess they're on a different bookshelf. Probably haven't unpacked them yet since I moved into this new place. All right, page 211. However, even many of the Jewish leaders believed him to be the Messiah, but wouldn't admit it to anyone because of the of their fear that the Pharisees would excommunicate them from the synagogue. For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. John chapter 12, verses 42 through 43 of the Living Bible. Uh, we've only got seven minutes left on the live streaming portion of the radio program. For those of you who are watching it live on YouTube or listening to it live at blogtalkradio.com forward slash fundamentally mormon. I'm opening up the phone lines for anyone who wants to ask questions, make statements, give commentary, whatnot. The phone number is a New York area code phone number, but anybody who can call long distance can call it for free. <clears throat> well, depending on your phone plan. The guest call in number is 917-889-8827. That's 917 917- Eight eight nine eight eight two seven. 889 You can also uh, chat there at blogtalkradio.com in the chat room while you're listening to it. And you can, uh, uh, you know, chat there at, at the YouTube live uh, stream as well. That's youtube.com forward slash user forward slash God is my compass, C-O-M-P-A-S-S. It's pretty easy. So, the fact that Jesus was excommunicated can be evidenced by reviewing the spiritual, the following scriptural passage passages. People were afraid to say anything positive about Jesus for fear of being cut off or cast out of the synagogues. John chapter nine verse twenty-two. Jesus warned his disciples that they would be excommunicated for believing and following him. John chapter sixteen verse two. And I tell people the same thing. If you believe that I am who I say I am, just learn from me and then be a light to the people in your in your congregation. Don't run around telling people that I'm Mashiach ben Yosef or the second witness of the Father or even a prophet. Because I want you to I don't want you to have to go through what I've gone through being kicked out of the synagogues or the churches. I think that people should be able to be in the churches and should be able to share 
what they have gleaned from this radio program in their congregations, in Sunday school, in priesthood meetings. So um, if God led you to this point, you're ready for it, I'm glad for that. But not a lot of people are ready for this. They don't even know that it's coming. They don't know that this stuff was prophesied to happen. They don't know anything about Rabbi Yitzhak Kadori, who prophesied that I would come forth shortly after Ariel Sharon died, which did happen in January of 2014. They don't know that Moroni talked about the man like unto Moses being a Messiah or a Christ, but the day had not yet come when he, he would be rejected by his people. They don't know that when Jesus gives the answer to who is Isaiah uh, chapter 11, when it talks about the stem, Jesus says, the stem is Christ. He doesn't say, I am the stem. You know, everybody just, and he talks in this way so that people can assume, <laughs> so that the only people who know what the scripture is actually talking about are they who get revelation from him because the only one who gives the correct interpretation is God. And it confirms it by the Holy Spirit. And when people assume, that's just them damning themselves, basically. Because they believe the lie of false doctrine. When, when people are like, oh, Jesus Christ is the stem, because in uh, Doctrine and Covenants, it says, you know, who's the stem? And Jesus says, verily I say unto you, the stem is Christ. They say, oh, that means Jesus. No, Jesus didn't say that. And you don't understand the meaning of the word Messiah or Mashiach or, or Christ. You, you don't even realize that uh, Cyrus, I can't go with Cyrus the Great, was called a Messiah or an anointed one or a Christ. The two anointed ones that stand before the Lord of the whole earth in Zechariah chapter 14, there are two Christs that stand before the Lord of the whole earth, not one. And they are Yehovah our Elohim. Uh, well, some deeper doctrine I want to get into, but Yeshua is the first witness of the Father, and he is known by the name of Jesus, the Christ, and myself, the second witness of the Father, known as Mashiach ben Yosef. So. All right, let's see. Jesus warned his disciples that they would be excommunicated for believing and following him, John chapter 16, verse 2. Same thing applies to today. The Pharisees warned the people that if they believed in Jesus, they would be excommunicated. Same thing applies today. If you believe that I am who I say I am and you tell anybody and it gets to your stake president or your bishop, you're going to get excommunicated. You're going to be cast out of the synagogues and the churches. That's not what I want for you. I want you to be a light to the people. So we have 90 seconds left in the live streaming portion of the radio program. Once the live streaming portion of the radio program at Blog Talk Radio goes down, nobody will be able to call. So if you do want to call, this is your last chance. We have an hour left in the, in the uh, what do you call it, overdrive portion of the radio program. But the, the phone number is 917-889-8827. That's 917-889-8827. We have 60 seconds left for people to join in on the program. And you can just listen. You don't have to talk. But if you do want to come on, push one. I'll see that in the studio. That there will be a question mark by your, your number, your phone number. And it will be able to open the line, and you can ask your questions or make your comments. So one more time, 30 seconds left before the live streaming portion of the radio program is over with. We're going into overdrive. If you call in, then you'll be on. If you don't, then you won't. So the phone number is 917-889-8827. That's 917-889-8827. Ten seconds before we go into, live, uh, into overdrive. All right, number four, the ancient prophets who foretold so many things about Jesus also mentioned that the Messiah would be cut off. That's excommunicated. Uh, that's what that means. That he would be excommunicated. That he 
cut off from the lending living, it partly, you know, that, uh, well, I don't want to get into it, but anyway, Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. If the Pharisees tried to throw him off a cliff, they would have first tried to destroy his reputation by excommunication. Luke chapter 4, verse 29. By their trying to stone him to death, indicated that they were trying to enforce all of the ancient laws against him. They would not have neglected the first and obvious punishment of casting out or excommunication. John chapter 10, verse 34, or 31. Number seven, since they brought Jesus up to the Sanhedrin Council in the Roman court to try to be tried for capital crimes, they would not have first uh, neglected to first try to save the reputation of the church by excommunicating him. John chapter 18, uh, yeah, chapter 18. Number eight, they excommunicated the blind man for his testimony of Jesus, so why would they neglect to cut off Jesus who bore testimony of himself? John chapter 9, verse 34. Or on page 212. Number nine, the Pharisees met in council and discussed every way to get rid of Jesus, including how to destroy him. Would they have overlooked the excommunication process? Matthew chapter 12, verse 14. Number 10, there is no significant sorrow, trial, or offense that would come to the people that Jesus had not experienced himself. Thus, excommunication would have undoubtedly been one of them. John chapter 18, verse 4. In this chapter, we have seen how the self-righteous Pharisees hunted down anyone who believed in Jesus or his teachings. They would cut off, cast out, or excommunicate them from the synagogues. Even those who just believed in his miracles were threatened with excommunication. It's because they needed to shut everyone up. How dare you even say anything that would cause people to even know his name? (laughs) (laughs) Kind of like Russell Russell Ballard did in um, an area conference in Salt Lake where he talked about me um, from the pulpit. But anyway, basically, you know, causing it so people wouldn't listen to my program, so because I'm, I'm that big of a threat to them. I mean, it's kind of interesting. I don't know how big of a threat to them I am, because I'm just some truck driver broadcasting from some farmhouse in central Utah. But, whatever. Jesus had, almost, uh, had also promised his disciples that they would be excommunicated from the church, but that they should not sorrow over it but rather rejoice. He told his disciples that they should put you out of the synagogues and separate you from their company and cast you out your name as cast out your name as evil. The disciples would not be above their master. So with Jesus, they kicked him out. And with everybody that they kicked out, God blesses because they were threats to the devil's kingdom who had ensnared itself within (laughs) within the church. If you're a threat to the devil's kingdom, you're going out. That's how the devil does it. These wolves in sheep's clothing They're the ones that do it. They'll call you all kinds of names, heretic, apostate, whatever. They not only cast Jesus out of their synagogues, but uh, but tried to cast him off a cliff. Another way they tried to reject him was to stone him to death. John said, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. John chapter 1, verse 11. But Jesus had to descend below all things so he could rise above all. In cases of excommunication among the early Christians, it resulted in the victims being shunned by the church, the community, their friends, and their families. They were banned from work and social functions and were prevented from purchasing necessities. They were classed as apostates and evil people. Christ and his disciples endured these conditions because because of their faith in the gospel. 
the fullness of the gospel, page 213. To summarize this chapter, number one, the Mosaic Church operated under the authority of the Levitical priesthood, and Christ held the office of rabbi in that church. However, Joseph Smith said that all prophets had the Melchizedek priesthood and were ordained by God himself. Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, page 181. Jesus had received that priesthood from his father and therefore possessed the highest priesthood authority. He had the fullness of the priesthood. Jesus attempted to teach higher laws of this higher priesthood and also perform miracles demonstrating the power that he had with God. These two factors caused both fear and envy among the chief priests and Pharisees, Matthew chapter 27, verse 18, Mark chapter 15, verse 10. Number three, the Jews excommunicated Jesus for teaching and living the doctrines of the higher priesthood while they themselves were living on only a Levitical priesthood level. Thus, Levitical priesthood holders were incorrectly attempting attempting to excommunicate a priesthood, a Melchizedek priesthood holder. <laughs> and that, like that's the same thing with me. Like in the uh, in the um, what do you call it? In my excommunication, like I, I wasn't there. They didn't. They, I didn't even allow me to be at the the trial. But I could have pulled out my uh, my patriarchal blessing where it says I've been given the fullness of eternal life. Like God is, has already call, uh, given me my calling and election. How they they have no authority to to cut me off from the priesthood when God has already given me my calling and election. And it talks about that right in my patriarchal. Bl- uh, blessing, but they don't care about that. I'm a threat to them because I expose how the church has changed and and bring to light doctrines that they have tried to hide ever since Satan got his claws into the kingdom, and they began to apostatize from the truth. And they won't repent because they're an authority and I'm not, even though God chose me to be a witness. It gave me more authority than they'll ever dream of having. Anyway, but uh, verse 4, Jesus did, uh, G- Jesus, his disciples, and all others from then on who believed in him were excommunicated from the synagogue. Jesus had to teach, live, and administer the higher ordinances outside of the Mosaic Church of the Jews. Number 5, the Mosaic Church did not become Christian. Rather, Christianity began outside of and separate from the Jewish church. Number six, essentially the higher principles of the true church and the fullness of the gospel were considered as an apostate religion. We're on page 214. For those of you following along, we're almost done. Point seven, this pattern has occurred repeatedly both in ancient uh, and latter days. Yep. The following table provides an interesting comparison between the Mosaic Church that existed among the Jews at the time of the of Christ and the Church of Christ. Church of Moses, Church of Christ. He uh, had a temple, but the Church of Christ had no temple. He had the Aaronic priesthood, but they had the Melchizedek priesthood. The lower church laws... Uh, and the higher church had the higher laws and ordinances. They were persecuted, persecutors, and they were persecuted. So, and it's the same thing in our day. People who cling to the fundamental parts of the restoration are persecuted by the church authorities who have rejected it and who don't want it to be even talked about. So, they persecute the fundamentalists who are fundamentalists because they believe in the restoration of the gospel and its fullness, where the apostate church doesn't. They don't believe. Anyway, but the uh, the Jewish church and the LDS church in our day, they teach milk doctrines, but the fundamentalists, they teach the meat because they can't handle the meat in the church, right? They can't. They, they can't even a, a handle being exposed for for some of the stuff that they taught 40 years ago, 45 years ago. <clears throat> they allowed sacred mem- uh, scattered membership, which is what the church does today. 
same as the Jews. Uh, the, the true church teaches members to gather as a hen um, would gather up her chicks because there's this doctrine called the gathering, not the scattering, but the church today was originally told to gather, but they decided to scatter because of the Reed Smoot hearings in Congress, uh, House hearings and the government telling us not to to gather anymore and all of that. So we're going to follow Babylon or we're going to follow God. The gathering has never been rescinded. And that's one of the signs of of the true church. They gather together. They shut up the kingdom of God, the Jews did, and the LDS church today does in their apostasy. The Christians of early days and the people of today who are fundamentalists, they proclaim the kingdom of God. The church today and the Jews love the uppermost seat because they wanted to be seen of men with their fancy suits and all of their fancy things. But they cast out uh they cast out the you know the Christians back then and they cut ca- they cast out the fundamentalists today. Same thing. Solomon Shlomo said that there's nothing new under the sun. The Jewish church omitted the the wittier laws. The true church lived the higher laws. Same difference today. Uh, the the Jewish church or the apostate church lived in extortion and excess. The true church lived in poverty and meekness. And that, like in the Doctrine and Covenants, we have instructions on how to live the law of consecration. No man should have that which is above another, wherefore the whole world lieth in sin. And in another place, it is not given to you about uh, how does it go? If you will be a Zion people, you must be equal in all things. That's the true church. But the false church, the apostate church, they live in excess. They have mansions. And I love Uchtdorf. He's got three mansions. Heber City, North Salt Lake, and Bountiful. Why does he need so many mansions so close to each other? But they're rich. And they could care less about the instructions in the Doctrine and Covenants. So, in fact, Russell M. Nelson's mansion is for sale. Uh, at least it was last year, late la- late last year in the fall, is when I saw it. Beautiful home. Why would you need a home that big? I don't know. But, you know, but now he's president of the church, so he'll move into the church condo where he can be protected by the security members. You know, but these guys live in these massive homes. Spencer Kimball didn't. He lived up on, um, oh, I don't know, I don't know, Holiday area, I think. I can't remember. I think it's south of Holiday. I don't remember. Anyway, but today they, they're just they're filthy rich. One, $126 billion in private investment accounts. They're a 501c3 status. They're supposed to take what they give and to help the poor and all that. You don't see LDS soup kitchens, though, for the homeless. Oh, if you got a place to cook and you're a ski bum, like one of my roommates back in the day, wasn't even LDS, but he knew because he did it every year, that he could be a ski bum and get the church to feed him. It's it's ridiculous. Anyway, lived in extortion and excess. Uh, the true church lived in poverty and meekness. Um, the apostate church had appearances of righteousness, and the true people, the true church, the true believers were called apostates. The apostate church trusted in men. Oh, they're going to do what their leaders tell them to because they're the ones in authority. They're the Sanhedrin, they're the high priest, they're the prophet, seer, and revelator. As opposed to the true church who trusts in God and tries to keep God's commandments, regardless of what that 
synagogue leader, that high priest, the Sanhedrin, or that prophet seer and revelator says, which, which contradicts former revelation, which Joseph Smith taught, if it contradicts former revelation, you cast them out, or cast um, them out as imposters. And they do, and you should, unfortunately. Uh, had one talent, or wife, the, the false church, you know, they give up the law of plural celestial marriage because they don't understand it. The true church or the true believers will actually have several talents or wives. They understand the law of plural celestial marriage and the law of adoption and why it's necessary to live, you know. But the apostate church, they reject it. Even though God never gave a revelation. And don't tell me the manifesto was a revelation because it was not. Charles Penrose actually confessed to writing it. He wrote it himself. He did not dictate a revelation from God. In fact, Wilford Woodruff and John Taylor were told by Jesus personally in the flesh himself, and they received a written revelation on the subject not to do away with it, but Wilford Woodruff gave in to, to the threats of the Bohemian Club and the Illuminati and the government of the United States of America, and they got rid of it. So that he feared man rather than fearing God. John Taylor, he feared God. He did what God wanted. Let's see. So the apostate church ties even the spices. But the true church, they lived the united order. That's one of the signs and fruits of a true church. They lived to have all things in common, just like they did in Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. They lived law of consecration, which we all covenant to in the, te- the te- temple endowment. None of us live. And most of us don't live anyway. As we begin the next chapter on Latter-day excommunications, many similarities of our time will be obvious. All right, so that's the end of that. And uh, oh, that only took, what, three, two and a half hours, something like that. So, yeah. All right, so um, we don't have anybody on the line and uh, nobody in the chat rooms. So I will uh, let this upload to YouTube, and shortly this will be uploaded to iTunes. And I'm going to go try to make some money before Shabbat starts. So thank you for everyone for listening to these programs, even if it is just a few of you. I really appreciate it. Um, Share them. Share the programs. If you want, you can... Um, get in contact with me and, and uh, any kind of donations um, will go towards the uh, program and all that I have to do to um, keep this alive. I don't know how I've got to come up with $199 next paycheck and $100 this paycheck. If I can get if I can get Google to re do my my website it won't screw everything up but i don't know if they're going to or not and i i can't do anything about it like you know i get shadow banned on youtube um my stuff is hidden on facebook except for my groups or people who follow my wall like follow me as a close friend you know they see it hopefully you know but um any extra money if if I had people actually helping me out like Jake Hilton does or like any of these other guys do, um, I would probably use it to boost my posts to share with more people. Because people, they like what I'm saying, but they don't want to share it because they're afraid of their family members and their church leaders and their church fellow church members. And I don't blame them. But if you did want to support, you could like, share, and subscribe on the YouTube videos. You could share them on Facebook, or you could help in another way. 
help me financially so I can post these and get the, you know, I like John DeLynn, we had to drive up to uh, Rexburg, Idaho the other day to drop off my, uh, my niece who has never been away from home before. From, she's from New Hampshire. We dropped her off at uh, Rexburg at BYU, Idaho. And on the way up, John DeLynn's got big old billboards you know, say, uh, are you suffering from a faith crisis? And then he, he puts mormonstories.org. You know, um, I saw him in Idaho Falls and Rexburg as well, and I'm pretty sure they're over in Boise. And who knows where I'll, the rest of them. You know, he can reach more people because he's advertising. If my message is important, then support this ministry. If it's only important because it's interesting and you're learning from it and you don't care to share it with anyone else, that's fine, I guess. I can't force anybody, but it would be nice if I had some help. And uh, I'm going to keep doing it whether or not anybody supports me or not. So anyway, but uh, I think that's the end of the program. Uh, Thank you for watching, everyone. Take care. God bless. And Shalom Alakim. Blog Talk Radio. Baruch Hashem, this is Mark Lichtenwalter coming to you live 